Revelation chapter number 6, we found in Revelation 5 that uh, there was a book presented and no one to open the book, but the person of the Lord Jesus stepped up and he was worthy. The Lamb of God is worthy to open the book with the seven seals. So these seals begin to be opened in, in chapter number 6. And uh, we'll begin reading with verse number 1 and just comment as we go along. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and beheld a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth uh, conquering and to conquer. Uh, now we see here a bow, a man with a bow on a white horse, and he goes forth to conquer, and he is conquering, and he had just a bow and no arrows. Now this takes place in the first part after the, the church is not here now. You realize the church is not uh, in this. The church is in heaven. Remember, we're in heaven and all the things that are going on down here on earth, but we're with the, we're with the Lord. So right after the rapture of the church, this man uh, on the white horse is going to appear. Now this, uh, you know, people have discussed this, whether it was the Lord Jesus. No, it's not the Lord Jesus. This is an imitator. Now whatever God has a, has a plan for, the devil's got some kind of imitation. And so this is the Antichrist on the white horse. And he's coming and he's going to be a, a, a man with great swelling words of man's wisdom. Uh, he's going to be a man that's got all the answers that the whole world is going to look up to. Uh, coming for, uh, probably from the European Union, those nations somewhere there. D is he alive today? I believe he is. Do you know who he is? I ain't got no idea. But I tell you what, you go home and try for something interesting to do, uh, just, key it, just Google search the Antichrist and you see what comes up. There's all kinds of ideas out there, but I don't know who it is and I'm not going to speculate as to who it is because I don't have any Bible to back up anything that I would uh, speculate about. And, and so if, you know, if I come across something, I'll let you know. But this man of sin, the Antichrist, uh, is his forerunners out there? I believe they are. I believe those that, that draw away from Christ. The Bible says there are many Antichrist, Antichrists in the world. And those that don't believe in Jesus as the Son of God are Antichrists. And, but, but this man of sin, there are forerunners out there that, uh, you know, that, that are uh, trying their best to lead peacefully. And you hear people say, you know, well, matter of fact, the president of Russia, I think he's nominated for the Nobel uh, uh, Peace, Pr uh, Peace Prize, uh, you know, the Nobel, that Nobel Prize uh, for peace. I think he, but why? Because he has uh, done something, you know, to, to stop something that might have happened. And so the, when, when people start rising like that and, and uh, want to be peacemakers, then you know soon the, the Antichrist is going to be ready to step on the scene. Is the world not right for somebody to say, I've got the answers? I mean, you look around, you, you can't look on the globe and not find where there's not turmoil going on and where there's not, you know, always some terrorist act going on and always... Uh, somebody, you know, somebody attacking someone else or the threat of someone attacking someone else. And all it would take was somebody with some stature, somebody with some uh, power, somebody that would, you know, that, uh, that, that could step up and rise to the occasion and proclaim, I've got the power. I've got the, the way to peace. Now, he would conquer without bloodshed. He would conquer the world and rule the world without bloodshed, simply uh, a bow with no arrows, and he would conquer without bloodshed because of his great swelling words. Who is this man of sin? Exactly what he is, he's a man of sin. He is the, a, the devil incarnate. Now, Christ came into this world, and he came as a baby in a manger, and he, uh, he came, you know, God in flesh. And so certainly as that imitator, the devil's going to come along as the devil in flesh and, and people are going to rise to him and they're going to bow to him and say, oh, look what he's done. And so all will, all will bow and, and say to him, okay, I've got all the answers. Now, I believe, and uh, as this first, it, the first three and a half years we're talking about here are the times that will be relatively peaceful on the earth. Now, there won't be much bloodshed. There won't be much violence. So see, the world is going. To, the world of unbelievers are going to be taken in uh, by the fact that there's peace on earth and everything's going to be well and everything's going to go fine. 
But after that three uh, and a half years of rule by, uh, by the Antichrist, then sudden destruction, the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation is going to set in. Now, after this, just picture in your mind now, uh, an earth where it's relatively peaceful. Now, sin will be prevalent. Sin will be unleashed. Uh, sin will be ever-present. All manner of evil will be ever-present, but there'll be no, no fighting, no wars. Now, there'll be, you know, I'm sure times will go on like they are as far as uh, uh, criminal activity goes on. But as far as the world is and with, uh, with wars, that'll, that'll about be, I believe, about be non-existent. So this man of peace, he's on the scene and he's got everything uh, under control. But listen what happens in verse number three. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now here's the, the, the rider of the red horse. And uh, uh, of course, I believe to be the Antichrist also. I'll, yeah, there'll be some disagreement on that, but I believe it's the same person. And he comes to rule with the sword and, and death. Uh, and they went out another horse that was red and power was given him that sat there on to take peace from the earth. So uh, the peace that is there is suddenly taken away. And literally, friend, at that moment, uh, brother will turn against brother. Um, neighbors will turn against their neighbor because he said, uh, the, the, took peace from the earth and they, they, that they should kill one another and there was given to him a great sword. So great fighting is going to occur among people. If peace is taken away from this earth and that peace is taken, what would this world be uh, today if all the peace was lifted? Man, you're talking about war. You're talking about battles. You're talking about killings. Uh, lawlessness would be, you know, law would be uh, absolutely, uh, you know, non-existent just about. The laws could not be enforced if total peace was taken out of this world. You know what's holding all this together today? You know what's got this world all in what it is and still got it glued together? God in heaven, amen. He knows what's going on. None of this that goes on in our world today surprises God one little bit because he, like I say, he's not up there wringing his hands wondering what's going to happen. God in heaven knows what's going to happen. Why has he not sent his son to gather the church out yet? Because the bride is not completed. But when that bride's completed, then it'll be time for uh, the Son of Man to come and, and uh, call his bride out. And when he calls his bride out, we're going to answer and we're going to be raptured out of here and then all, all the things that are going to go on earth can happen. But you know what? As long as we're here, none of this can take place. As long as believers are here and the Spirit of God is here and the Spirit of God is with believers, when believers leave, the Spirit of God goes with it. And when the, the Spirit of God won't, you know, the Holy Spirit of God won't be here uh, to, you know, to keep peace. So when he's gone, we're the ones that's holding everything back. The Christians, the believers, the born-again ones are the ones that are keeping all the things uh, at bay that are going to break loose when the church is out of here. And so the, the, the Antichrist can't come back till the church is gone. And friends, so you live faithful to God. I believe we're living close to that day when Jesus comes and we ought to live and try our best to be as faithful to the Lord as we can and we ought to try to stand with, uh, with the, the, what's right in the Word of God as much as we can. By the help of God, uh, we ought to be faithful to Him. Why? Because that, that uh, white horse is coming, being the Antichrist coming to rule with peace, and then that red horse of, of death and that red horse of, of killing and that red horse of, uh, you know, of destruction is about to be loosed also. And that'll be at least three and a half years from now. If Jesus come back tonight, the events I'm telling you about right now would happen beginning tomorrow. If the, if the rapture took place tonight, I believe that the, that the, the uh, beginning of the tribulation would begin the moment it started. And that man of peace would show up three and a half years uh, later than that the red horse would come along. And that's when total destruction starts on the earth. Friend, there's going to be things... Uh, happening in this period of time that you're certainly glad that you're not going to be a part of. 
and I don't know how a lost man, except they're blinded, and I don't know how they could, could uh, uh, hear this or, or uh, be a, you know, think about this without not wanting to be a part of it. But so we read on here, after this, what happens after war and after fightings and after, uh, after everything that goes on? What happens after that? Here comes the, uh, the, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld a, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now what's this talking about? What's all this about? Well, here, here comes that black horse. And that black horse is a black horse of famine. After war comes famine. Uh, you, you remember back, I mean, things get scarce. Uh, back, my, my dad was telling me back during, uh, right after World War I, and after, after that took place, how, while as I'm going to, how scarce things uh, became and how people, you know, uh, they were asking people to save the, uh, the bacon grease and, and all of these things to use for weaponry, and, and there wasn't any paper money. They're just, everybody, nobody had anything. Uh, because of war. Well, that friend, you just think when there's been when there's been war going on for some time, and brother has been against brother, and neighbor against neighbor, and nation against nation, and when all these things are taking place, right after that comes that black horse of famine. Now you think about some of these farmers that are farming today. Uh, those that are saved are going to be going to go to be with the Lord, but those that are left behind. Uh, they're going to have to spend all that they have in trying to protect what they've got. And so there's not going to be much farming going on. Think about it. If you were a farmer that had uh, hundreds of acres of, say, corn or wheat, and uh, you, you supplied many, many thousands of people with grain, yet you're trying to protect what you got, and you're trying to protect all that you have so you don't have time to go out and plow the fields and, and harvest to harvest the grain. So look, friend, uh, food is going to become very scarce. Now, it's talking about here you can buy, in that day, you can buy a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see, not, and see thou hurt not the oil and wine. Now, for a penny, uh, this is speaking of a day's wages. And so for a penny... Uh, you can buy, or for a day's wages, you can buy a measure of wheat. Now, friend, that's a lot. I mean, that's, that is a lot for a measure of wheat. Now, let's look at it this way just for a minute. Now, uh, the, uh, the wheat is, is what the people with the, you know, not the elite people, but the people uh, with the most money, they can buy a measure of wheat for a penny, or... You can buy three measures of barley for a day's wages. Wheat is a is a good source of uh, you know of, of uh, a good source of uh, food, but therein the barley is not as good. But you can buy more of it, and so it's a, it's a dark it's a dark black bread, and and uh, wheat makes a, a good light bread, and so uh, that's what you can get. And friend, I don't know how much you make during the day, but if you made a hundred dollars a day then that's what it would cost you for a measure of wheat or three measures of barley. Now, we talk about inflation. How many of you remember when you could go to the grocery store and buy a, a loaf of bread for uh, 29 or 39 cents? See, it ain't that been that long ago. Well, now, if you buy just a regular loaf of bread, it's what, $2 for just a regular loaf of bread? And if you buy wheat, that's why, if you buy wheat bread and get, you know, get, get uh, 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 supposedly a a better, healthier bread, then it's three, four dollars uh, 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 a loaf. And uh, so I, that's what I try to eat. I try to, I love white bread, man. I love, I love white ble bread and mayonnaise and bologna. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it is better on white bread. But I don't eat it much anymore. I had to, I had just had to, you know, I just had to think about that just a minute. So I try to eat the healthier bread, which is good, but I just don't like as much as the white bread. But anyway, that's here and there. But now think about it. If you had to spend, if you had to work all day for a loaf of bread, friend, how, how could you feed your family on one loaf of bread? That's what's going to cause people even more to turn against their neighbor and try to take what they've got. And so uh, if, if, if that loaf of bread cost you a day's, you know, cost you a penny, 
then that same loaf or, or, or cost you three, four dollars and that same loaf of bread during the tribulation is going to cost you about $32 uh, a loaf. Now, that's just, that's just something we can kind of relate to. Can you imagine paying $32 for a loaf of bread? Uh, friend, that's, that's kind of an example of what it's going to be like during the tribulation. And if you've got the money, now it says, hurt not the oil or the wine. Now, this is talking about classes of people. The people that will be trying to buy the loaves of bread will be people like you and me. The oil and the wine represents those that are of the wealthiest, of the elite. Uh, they'll have no problems. They'll be able to get what they want, and uh, they'll fare pretty well even during this. But they're not going to escape because their day's coming. And so there is two uh, groups of people here, we believe, the, those that are, are middle class and poor and those that are rich and richer. And the rich get richer and the poor get poor. And that's, that seems to be the way uh, that this is going. So we see that. And after, after that famine is coming along, people are going to be dying of starvation. People are going to be, uh, you know, trying to get something to eat, just anything to get to eat. And there's not going to be much to have to eat. And people are going to starve to death. And there's going to be a great famine in the land, worse than, worse than this world has ever known. And there's no nation going to be exempt. The whole world is going to be in famine. And so the, the countries that are, are not well off now are going to be even less well off uh, during the tribulation. Now, as we say, the elite do, do pretty well. The, the oil and the wine represent the elite. They're going to do uh, pretty well. But listen, to the, as, we, as we look at this uh, fourth seal, and we're going to stop right here tonight because this is the last of the beast of the, of the four horses. So we're going to stop with this one tonight. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power is given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. Oh, my, this pale horse represents death. And that's always what we think about. Paleness represents death. When someone dies, the first thing happens is their, is their blood uh, quits circulating. That's what gives you color. And we see that paleness. And this is what this illustrates. And so the fourth part, and I looked at it. Let me read it again. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given to him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with a sword. Can you imagine the millions of people that are going to be killed, uh, you know, it says with the sword and with hunger. They're going to starve to death. Uh, death's going to overcome them. Uh, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be uh, killed with the sword. The beasts of the earth are going to tear them up. And friend, this is a terrible time. This is not a fairy tale. This is real. And this is something that's going to take place. And this pale horse of death, after famine, comes a great death, disease. Uh, after famine comes a lot of disease, and that's what's going to spring up during the tribulation. These are, the four, these are what the four horses represent in the book of Revelation. And so, I, again, I'm going to stop there because we, it, turns from the, uh, it turns from the beast to, uh, to something else. And then there's, after the sixth beast, there is a, a uh, parenthetical verses of Scripture that we'll get to before the seventh seal is opened. And so before we, after the sixth seal, the seventh seal is on uh, uh, down in the book of Revelation. So we will get to that. But it's going to be a terrible time on planet earth when the tribulation begins. The next thing to happen is the rapture of the church. Uh, after the rapture of the church, that happens somewhere between the end of Revelation 3 and Revel beginning Revelation 4. After that takes place, immediately the man of sin is going to step on uh, you know, step on the scene, and he's going to uh, have a you know have great swelling words. And of course, this day of of technology, he'll be able to broadcast the whole world that he's got all the right answers. And 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 uh, you know, people people are not going to make it in. People are going to die. Uh, you know, in this condition. And when this pale horse and those that that are slain, uh, blood's going to run, and and there's going to be terrible bloodshed on the earth. After all the famine, after all goes on, there's no peace, friend. There's no peace left whatsoever. So three and a half years of the worst conditions that you could even imagine are going to take place as these uh, seals and the vials uh, are opened and the trumpets, and we'll get to all of that. And as all these take place, friend, I'm glad I'm saved in the grace of God. 
And friend, I would not, you know, is anybody going to be saved during the, during the tribulation? There will be people saved during the tribulation, but it won't be people that have heard the gospel. Their day is today. People that have heard the clear presentation of the gospel, uh, they will not have an opportunity to be saved. And, and so it will be mostly Jews that are saved during the, uh, during the tribulation. And, of course, we'll get on into that later. But listen, friend, if you know somebody's lost, you better encourage them to get right with the Lord before it's too late. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this privilege around the word of God tonight. And, Lord, I trust, God, by your help, we've rightly divided the word of truth. And, Lord, anything we've said contrary to thy will, God, I pray that you forgive us, Lord, and help us, uh, Father, to, uh, to clarify. But, God, I thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Lord, I'm glad you saved me by your grace, and I'm glad I'm on my way to heaven. Lord, I pray, Father, when the rapture takes place, God, and we're out of here, and God, I pray that there'll be a, uh, those that are, that, that are lost today will get saved before they're, before they're uh, eternally too late. We'll thank you now for what you do in Jesus' name.